All right, here we go. We have Dan Perlman and Hassan Johnson of the show Flatbush Misdemeanors. Welcome to Flat TV. What's up, man? Yeah. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. Stockton and Malone. <laughs> <laughs> Who's who? I just, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll take Stockton. Yeah. Right? I loved Why him not? as a kid. Yeah. Right? Well, yo, man, I love the show. I've watched every episode, both seasons. Uh, and the show kind of, for me, just kind of came out of nowhere. I was just, you know, I, I didn't hear anything about it. There was no real kind of press or promo. I was just, you know, going through Showtime and I'm like, oh, what's this? And then I just got hooked. That's what's up. Nice, That's what's, it's like a Scud missile, right? <laughs> and, and Desert Storm <laughs> snuck right up on you. Boom! It's a surprise. Yeah, it's a surprise. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. It's, it goes, we go in with no yeah. hype or expectation. That's so it. everyone's Just pleasantly killed. surprised. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, this is the first time that both of you are here on Vlad TV. So mm -hmm. I want to get in both of your stories. And I actually want to start with you, Dan. So right. you grew up in New York City. I did, yeah. Okay, so what was New York growing up in the, in the 90s? Um, I mean, I, I, I felt lucky cause, well, I grew up in Manhattan. So I grew up, um, uh, uh, Upper East, both my parents worked, um, you know, so I feel like I had a very good upbringing, but then I also felt lucky that like my closest friends were very scattered. So one of my best friends, coach was still one of my best friends to this day was in Washington Heights. Another best friend was in Jackson Heights. Another was in Bayside Queens. So I feel like another was in the Bronx. So I feel like I was able to be um, exposed and like, you know, spend a lot of time in different neighborhoods. So it wasn't too uh, insular for me. Cause I feel, I, I think that's, uh, that's a thing with New York that maybe people don't talk about as much that as diverse as it is, it can be very siloed off and uh, uh, segregated a little bit. So I feel like fortunate I was able to, you know, see different areas from a young age and spend not have too narrow an upbringing, you know? Well, you always want to do stand up. Yeah. Yeah. That was always the goal to, to be a stand up comedian who makes things. So I, you know, I would write jokes in my notebook and hide them under my bed because I was scared to say I'm allowed. And I wrote letters to comedians asking, how do you do stand up and stuff and asked them all a different question because I, I thought they all knew each other. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I got to ask them all a different thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was always the hope, you know. The jokes probably warded off the boogeyman too under the <laughs> Well, that's the only thing they did because they didn't make anybody laugh. <laughs> if they did one thing, it Boogie was that. Because no, it didn't work. Man don't exist over here. They just collected dust. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, I actually found a YouTube channel. I guess it's one of your old YouTube channels mm -hmm. where you did a stand-up from like ten years ago. It was about ketchup. Oh yeah! Wow, that was one of the first. That was one of the first jokes I ever did. It was this joke about. Um, and this is a thing that I actually, I said, I finally like went into therapy when I was like 21 and I said this, I was talking about social anxiety and I said this to the therapist and, oh, and she gosh. started laughing because I was talking about how I felt like I couldn't start a conversation, oh, you know? Okay. And so I said, when I would start a conversation, I feel like, like, you know, when you take a ketchup bottle and you turn it upside down to get the ketchup out before you do get this like watery yeah, kind of tomato juice liquid. Thing, That's yeah. me at the start of a conversation. <laughs> I was saying, you're just, it's just like nonsense and watery juice. <laughs> And I was like, did you get to the good stuff? Right, right. I was like, I'm jealous of ketchup <laughs> right. bottles because you know they're they're transparent. I think I said, and so you sit through that because you know you're going to get there. But yeah, me, yeah. I just stumble out, and they're like, what? And I'm like, no, no, it <laughs> yeah. takes some time. But anyway, yeah, that was that was a big for for uh, early on. It was very early in me doing stand up, and so that was a fun thing because I was like, oh, a lot of these like anxieties or or thoughts or fears or whatever, or not being able to express shit when you say it aloud. Oh, people can connect with it and and uh, resonate. So, so that was hugely helpful for me. You know. Well, then in 2014, you were on this web series called uh, Moderately Funny. Yeah. So that that was um, so I did that with uh, uh, Kevin, uh, who I co-created Flatbush with. So we we met doing open mics. So I started doing open mics maybe like 2013, I want to say, 2012, 2013. And when you start, you just go and bomb at open mics. You know, you just get up for two to three minutes and have other comedians kind of just stare okay. at you. Yeah. You just <laughs> say whatever. And then half the people are completely insane and, you know, and, but then you find people who share different sensibilities or whatever. So 
uh, Kevin had mo- recently moved from Texas. And so we shared that same kind of drive to just make shit beyond stand up, just to keep, to like churn stuff out, whether or not it was any good, you know? So we started making sketches together. And yeah, Moderately Funny was the name of it. Right. And some of the same people from Flatbush Misdemeanors were actually showing up at some of those early skits. I think Kareem was in that one skit. Yeah. Kareem played, uh, we did a sketch where. I'm going to, st- we're, it was, we were in the Long Island City Projects and I'm going to see, yeah, I saw it, you saw, I went, I'm going to see yeah. Kareem's <laughs> sister, it turns out. And Kareem was so funny. Like that, I think that, that was, I had seen him do stand up, but that was the first time we'd like worked together that I met him and he was so funny. He's just like yelling at me and he's like, I don't even know why he started getting into this. He's like, what am I, a frog? Like, what am I, what am I, a gorilla? Yeah, yeah, what am yeah, I, yeah, 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 what am yeah. I, a fish? And he starts like doing all these impressions of the animals and these kids start lining up. You can like hear them in the background of the sketch. They start lining up like in the playground yeah, yeah. and they're just cracking up. He's being so funny. And so, yeah, Kareem Green. So when, then when we were writing Flatbush, I was like, well, he's my stepdad because it's just, he's just so fun to play off. Like I just. That was a no brain. I could, you know, I could, yeah, just want to do scenes with him forever. So <laughs> yeah, but that was fun because, you know, we're comedians and comedians are used to, um, you know, we go do a lot of unpaid shows and a lot of like thankless whatever. So, you know, those are the people we knew. And so those people you get to show up and just have them be funny and you know that's the benefit of comics they're not going to have looked at the script they're not going to have like read it they're not going to know what they're doing or why they're there but they know who they are so if you make them comfortable they make every scene better you know well watching that it almost seems like that's almost the the blueprint for what flatbush misdemeanors ended up being later on for sure totally yeah i mean that that sort of like that gave us the idea because, you know, the sketches that we did, most of them aren't even online because they're, they're pretty bad. But like <laughs> some of them were set in like an office type world and some of them were set in that world that is what Flatbush became. And that one felt more um, unexplored and cool and, and, and different. So that's the route we went. But, though, yeah, those sketches were super helpful in figuring out what we like to do and what seemed funny and who we liked working with and, yeah, all that shit. Okay. So you and Kevin ended up hooking up. And you guys start working on Flat, Flatbush Misdemeanors originally as just a YouTube video? So we wrote it. We wrote Flatbush as a pilot. So it was like a 35-page script. And we showed it to some people. And they're like, I don't know what this is. They had no idea what to make of it. There was nothing. You know what I mean? They just didn't know. <laughs> Decipher it. Uh, yeah. So, um, so then we ended up – so then I – yeah. So we had that and it was just kind of sitting for a minute. Um, I did a, a pilot for Fox. I did like an animated pilot. And that was the first time I'd gone through that and written mm. a pilot and anything like that that uh, got anywhere. So it was cool because I went through the steps or whatever and then it doesn't go to series, but you kind of go through mm-hmm. that process. And then I came back uh, and was just like, I just wanted to like make something. Like that from my perspective, it was like, just want to make something. So we took that 35 page script, chopped up anything that would be budget. And we were just left with 15 pages and we shot it piecemeal. You know, we borrowed friends cameras it's split into five parts you know just because that's when we could we used it on three different cameras we snuck onto the subway we had comedians show up again we bribed a janitor to let us into a school on a saturday and then one of the kids the kid who was playing the original zayna she bailed at the last minute because she's like i gotta get ready for my school dance and so we're like we're just like in a school for nothing like yeah it's like i get it from her perspective you know but uh so you know we just we got the thing made and threw it online and nobody cared like nobody watched it but that first one was like a 15 minute short it started doing well at film festivals and that was kind of what got the ball rolling you know Okay. So, by the way, why that name, Flatbush Misdemeanors? Um, I don't remember the exact origin of it, but I know – I mean, we were talking about different titles. Um, Flatbush seemed like the perfect kind of setting for it because oh, definitely. it's like – you know, I mean, it's such a historic neighborhood. It's a neighborhood that it feels very much like a, an island uh, on an island, you know, uh, uh, we both, uh, Kevin and I both live there now, but we're not uh, uh, b- born there. We weren't raised there. So, but it's this, it's a neighborhood that it has a lot of different, it's very cool when you can walk two blocks in any direction and feel like you're in a different world, you know, in terms of the history, the architecture, the people there, 
it's like largely Caribbean neighborhood. There's just like a lot of different elements to it that feels very like diverse and vibrant there. And then the misdemeanor aspect of it, I, Kevin put it well once when we were talking about how like a lot of the characters are going to, you know, in life you have to cut a lot of corners, yeah, you know, definitely. Hassan calls it troubleshooting. Yeah. You have to like, you have to just, you know, whether it's jaywalking, you have to yeah. do whatever. You ha We all have to cut a little corner just to get through the day because it's so fucking hard to get through the day. So that's the misdemeanor aspect. It's not even like these are outright crimes. It's just right. these little infractions, infractions that you if, do if you will. just God. to tread water, you yeah. know? So that's... Stay afloat. And, and you hopefully don't judge the characters for any of it, mm -hmm. you know? So that's, that's sort of what the thesis is. I mean, yeah, when I first moved to New York in 2002, I lived in Flatbush on a church in East 18th. Oh, so, that's sure. cool. Smack you know, dab in yeah. the middle. <laughs> right in the middle. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So when I watch it, I'm like, oh, okay, this is a real familiar feel, you oh, know, nice. to the whole series. Uh, okay. So you put together this, you know, this digital short, you start taking it to film festivals, and it started to actually get recognition. Um, was it actually nominated for an Oscar at that point? No, it wasn't. It wasn't uh, nominated. So they, they certain film festivals are more prestigious. So it won at one of them. It won like the Grand Jury Award, which I guess right. qualifies it to get nominated for the Oscar. You have to have won like some Grand Jury Awards at like important film yeah, festivals, like super prelim, right? Exactly. <laughs> so then it was it was eligible. It got to the stage of being you know eligible right. to be on that short list to get nominated. And um, so that was cool. I mean, to win that grand jury thing because the shorts, which are not online, the the web series, you know, technically it's a, a mess. Like we couldn't we couldn't uh, color it, we couldn't wow, sound mix sound, it, right. we, we yep, cheap sound. Nothing. Like wow. it's it's really rough technically. We're three different cameras, like it's crazy. But it had jokes in it. I think that was the biggest thing because if you go to those film festivals right. and you sit through those stuff, especially the narrative shorts. They play them like in a block. They do. Yeah. Like most of them are dramatic. They're people who are trying to show they can make features. Mm -hmm. They're people who are like, uh, um, so it's going to be a lot of tragedy. It's going to be a lot of like a baby dies, you know, somebody is set on fire. Like it's a, a lot of really sad shit. Yeah, so we just dream. It's a amount of time. Yes. C condensed tragedy. <laughs> yeah. And so then they show ours and it's just, you know, it's Kareem like jumping up and down and telling me to like, yeah, no. you know, hold his food or whatever and saying, call me daddy. And it's just, it just has jokes. jokes. And so that's right. people in the room. It's tough to tell in the room. And it breaks but, the monotony too. It breaks the monotony. And it's tough to tell in a room if like a drama is working. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, Especially yeah. in a short thing. But a comedy, it's easy to tell if it's working. People are laughing. <laughs> so I think that was hugely helpful for it, um, for sure. Okay. So then Showtime ends up picking it up. Right. Yeah. So go ahead. Well, which is a big deal to get a, to get a series on Showtime uh, or HBO is considered like the twin towers of, of course. Mm -hmm. you know, in terms of, uh, you know, series. So how did you guys end up getting picked up by Showtime? So the film festivals gave it some momentum and then some production companies were interested and we were lucky to have a few different offers. And we started working with one production company and then took it to networks. So we had the, so we had the pitch for it and we had the, the like emotional arc of the season pretty much planned out of like, this is what a season would be. This is where, you know, uh, uh, Dan is going to start and where he's going to end up. This is where Kevin is going to start and end up. Right. This is the role that <clears throat> Drew plays in the story and how that's going to cause wrinkles and complications in their friendship and, and work and lives and everything. And so it was just kind of taking that into networks. And then we were lucky to have a few offers for it, but Showtime totally got it. They loved the web shorts also, which was, I think, also incredibly helpful. I don't think it gets picked up without those shorts because I think that showed the like tone and feel yeah, of it. Yeah, because that's what I had got familiar with right. the show was the web shorts. Right. Yeah, so I that, was like, there's a vision here. There's something right. going on. There's something brewing. Which which I don't think we would have been able to like convey just through the script. I mean, we tried and they were like, what? Yeah. And so I think that was usually helpful. So yeah, from there, we had uh, Showtime. Uh, we started working with them. We had to write the first two scripts um, and then and then from there got the season order. 
Okay, so Hassan, when did you get involved in the project? Because you weren't part of the original shorts, right? Yeah, exactly. And then that's what I'm saying when I jumped in and I said that's what I saw at first because what happened was it's still COVID. We can't go in rooms and audition anymore. And I'm the quintessential actor. I need to go to audition. Like I like auditioning. Right. Like, and then but not to the, the to the fact that when it's, I don't book something and it comes out, I don't watch it because I'm not <laughs> in it. But I like to sharpen my blade. Yeah. So I wanted to audition for real for this because I knew what it was. I knew exactly what the shit was. I seen it. I know that guy, that character, Flatbush being the backdrop. I said this will work. So, but then I said I didn't want to do a tape though. I don't want to waste my time on a tape. I don't know how arbitrary. Like I don't know how. Deep, Dan, Kevin, how how would it would it how how deep into a soul of the character they're trying to search for that I don't think I'd be able to convey on a tape. I do well, I do great tapes, but I did not want to waste my energy on it. So I told the song, the song, the song was too good. He's like, get the fuck out of here with that tape. He's like, I'm not taping for that shit. Look out how fucking long I've been good. I've been good, too good, too long. Tom, and the, and the, Tom Brady's not going to training camp. Practice, practice. <laughs> uh, all that AI shit. Yeah, in a nutshell, with Dan saying. So I came up, I grew a brain and came up with an idea to do a Zoom. Let, let me just talk to them. Let them know that I understand what the vision is, right? So it was Dan, Kevin. And I think I didn't even know Nastaran was on there. Oh, there. sure, sure, sure. Right. It was a couple of yeah, people well, yeah. I didn't know that were on the Zoom until I started making, I guess, some key points and valid points. And then I just was hearing some ad libs coming in, like, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. So, so I'm I'm people, people are listening, they know that I get it. Yeah. And basically the Zoom went well and I was in there like swimwear. But and I'm glad they were they were, you know, willing to take the Zoom call because I said I could get them to know who I could get them to know who Drew is better through me. I mean, and they're the creators, but I said I know I could do it, and then they got it. We, we just thought it was, it was, we were like, man, I'll just do that. It would be great to zoom with Hassan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, if, if nothing Hassan, else, right? Hassan, Hassan cool. wants to uh, talk to us. Yeah, yeah that'd be cool. I was like, let me kick it with y'all. Let me just go. <laughs> you great. know, let's have a little cyber brunch or something real quick, and it, and we chopped it up, and it went and it went well, and then. And and then it's like how even you said, Vlad, it's a big deal to get it to like showtime. But the way the momentum of everything went wasn't like this big deal. It was like, I don't know what it was like for them when they did. Well, he said what it was like when they did. You know, they borrowed cameras. They went and they just went with the blood, sweat and tears. But then when we came together, the culmination was so natural. You wouldn't have think or thought about all the red tape it take to get to that level. It was like that shit just hit and we did it. Yeah, I mean, and from the start, like from Hassan first coming in, because it's, you know, Hassan was one of the, uh, uh, Hassan and Kristen, who plays Zayna, mm -hmm. were like the two most important characters that were not who was in the initial web series. Exactly. So we write, we're writing the first season without knowing the voice. You know, right. uh, we knew Kareem's voice. We knew like what he's going to say and how he's going to perform it. And so it, it was... It was really cool that first table read when we see like, oh, they're coming to life. Right, and this right. is and, and this is Drew, and he's like embodying it. And, and, and don't get it twisted because the original Drew now is a beast and did his oh, thing. Yeah, so yeah. now I'm like, I gotta outdo this shit because his presence is felt on camera. Except for the part where Kev's like he used to beat the shit out of him in scenes because he just can't <laughs> learn to pretend. So he was like, he wouldn't have made it anyway. Through the, <laughs> the original Drew, his name is Drew Doughty. He's yeah. in the first and uh, ninth episodes of the first season as one right. of as one of Hassan's friends yes it's it's Napoleon who's playing the goose Blue, game right and uh, and drew who's playing uh, uh John another John, character. that's right yeah. and and then Hassan playing drew and so he was the original drew in the web series right. and then he was in the writer's room also uh, this season so and he's a great actor great yes writer, he is so I'm like funny. I gotta outdo this to a degree right but I get the assignment I got the assignment and it and it did it just worked out and then with Zayna with Kristen playing Zayna I think our chemistry were like you know we've done projects before it just feels like yeah. we've been here together before and I was just happy for that well Hassan so you played Drew Hill 
Yeah. <laughs> Who's been found? Drew what Hill. Saying I, ju- I just realized that. I just <laughs> realized see, the when you said it. Drew Hill. I knew okay. it, but then when you just said it, the way it sounds is like I think everyone else is just a catch it's, on. It's funny because I don't think it's ever been said aloud, but people say like Mr. Hill, and right, then people slowly right. piece it together. It You're like, wait, is his name Drew Hill? Right. Yeah. They don't ever just say his name in full right. cadence. <laughs> It's like Mr. Hill or Drew. Yeah. Hey, Drew Hill? All right. <laughs> Drew Hill, the R&B group, with, starring Cisco. Right. There yes. we go. Okay. And you essentially play, I mean, you terrorize everyone on the show. You play the main villain, essentially. <laughs> which, I mean, later on, you start to kind of gel with other characters. But that first season, like, everyone's just terrified of you. Yeah, because it's like there's a right way, wrong way, and Drew's way. <laughs> And then there's a median in there that Drew comes up with because it's like it's gotta it's gonna be more right and less wrong, and it's he and that'll suffice. He could live with that outcome as right. long as the right the the right's greater than the wrong in Drew's eyes at least. Because he because I mean we all know right from wrong, right? Drew's taking right. care of his family. Yes. He loves his niece to death. Yeah. He really values her education. Right. You know, all the things that they, you know, implemented in the first season. And he's steadfast to that. So there's just that, there's just that median that Drew fault that he's going to find and make everything he does and says justifiable. So to him, he's not terrorizing. It's just protocol. Right. It's like, if I don't do this, I'm not going to get to my destination. Right. I'm not going to be able to, it's not conducive to what I'm trying to accomplish. So, yeah, I don't I don't think uh, yeah, I think in that first like scene of the first episode, mm-hmm. you can th- watch and think like, "Oh, Drew is the villain." But I don't think of Drew as the villain at all. I think one fun thing with the show is you can look at any of the characters and be incredibly annoyed at them right. because they all at any given time. They all act, you know, selfishly at times. They all uh, are short-sighted at times, but they all I, you know, from the writing perspective, you have to like get why they're making the choices they're making. And I understand why Drew is making all the choices he's making, right. you know? But so, and so it, I think, yeah, I think he's coming at it from his perspective, which is what he needs to do to protect his own family and all, his own times, livelihood. Right. And so that's one thing I, I do really like about the show is that to any character, to to my character, especially that first season, I'm like, oh, this guy... Like we got to get away from him. We got to get whatever, yeah, and then, yeah. and then over the course of the second season, my character evolves to where Kevin's character evolves pretty quick in the first yeah, season, which yeah. is like I have empathy for for this person, yeah. and for my character, it's like, oh, I got to grow the fuck up. Yeah, because if he just did this, this, this other way or that way, he wouldn't be in that. It's like you know, right. you got these builders. Everyone has an assignment, and then one person, whether it be Dan, Kevin, Drew, or whoever, they miss a nail or a screw. Right, and then you got to. Re- Take everything apart right. and rebuild the shit. Yeah, right. it's a toothpick house, <laughs> a and toothpick they keep house. removing the wrong exactly. Jenga piece, and everything's <laughs> collapsing. But I, yeah, I think I think that's cool because that's anybody we know in life, anybody we love. They have major flaws. Yeah, yeah. They uh, mess up, and you can choose to have empathy for it or not. Or not. But, yeah. But I, I, that it just feels very human, and and that's what Hassan brings so naturally to that character is he's like just so likable that it's like that he can just say a line, just like a, a basic line, like, but you're their best dancer. Or he can say like, I'm going to smack the shit say out of you. <laughs> they're, and they're both funny. I believe them both. I know I, they're both fully on the table. And, right. and also he's like, he's so like precise with how you do it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. it's like, I hope it's not weird. I'm complimenting you. In no, front, but no, it's like, I'm listening because these are the things that I've started to have a revelation of during the second season. I'm like, oh, I'm starting to enjoy Drew. I was just, yeah. it was just a thing at first. And then it's like, now I'm starting to see the layers and then everything else. Like and, you're breaking it down. But it's so, yes, it's so precise. It's like, you remember mm-hmm. Greg Maddox? Yeah. The pitcher? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, 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 that's Hassan. Like with everything he said, it's like, You'll put it exactly, the the line will land in the exact millimeter it's supposed to land yep. on, you know? Yep. Kareem's Randy Johnson up there. Oh, He's throwing Randy 130 Randy. Oh, yeah, is he? miles per hour. Yeah, he yeah. never but lets up. Right. Hassan will just stay totally within himself and still show an insane amount of range. And it's it's very, very cool to watch. Nah, good looking out, Dan. Appreciate that. Uh, well, Dan, you play Dan Joseph. Yeah. Uh, a public school teacher who is addicted to Xanax. Sure, yes. Uh, 
in your personal life, did you ever, you know, play around with pills or anything else like that? Did that come from a real thing or that was just for the show? No, I, I, I did. You know, if you ever tried Xanax, it's, it's very good. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's not for nothing. <laughs> there's a reason, there's a reason people like it. You yeah, know, right. you try, you try any kind of drug people get addicted to and you're like, oh, I see what people I like. I see what this. people like about it. Right. Um, I, I wasn't, I wasn't as bad as, um, uh, my guy on the show. I think any, I, I hope that guy is a lot worse than me in every way, but also in that way. But it, it is a thing where it's like, yes, that was a thing that I had uh, an issue with. I had to stop uh, taking. But it's also a thing that, like we're talking about, like, you know, vices and corner cutting and stuff that you don't even realize is a problem because a thing like that can be all prescribed. And you're just taking this prescribed dose and everyone's doing it. And so in your head, you're it's like, okay. well, somebody wrote this for me, so yeah, it's yeah, fine. Yeah. I'm not I'm not like buying it from under a bridge so you can write it off <laughs> as it's yeah. all being, as it all okay. Like self-medicating. Well, right. And then it just slowly kind of evolves. And it's si similar, to, and it felt cool to like arc that out and pull at that string and then arc it out to being like, oh, but and that's similar to what Hassan's character is going through mm -hmm. where it just starts as a thing you're not really questioning and you can write off, but then it just kind of spirals without even, you're like, whoa, how yeah. did how we even did get, get here? here? Right. Exactly. Um, so yeah, no, that did, that did come from a real place. And the public school teacher thing, I, I studied education in school. I thought maybe I would teach if I didn't have the courage to do comedy or, or to try that route, even though that's what I always wanted to do. So that's who I feel like I, I would have been otherwise, just a, a shitty teacher who's well-meaning but fails constantly and uh, takes a lot of pills. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, the show premiered uh, on May 23rd, 2021 on Showtime. And then by August of that same year, it was actually renewed for a second season. Right. Mm -hmm. So when it first came out, was it a hit or was it one of those things that sort of was a slow growth kind of thing? I think it's still a, a slow build, right. you know? I yeah, think it's gradual. It's gradual, yeah. Because, I mean, you know, Hassan's the biggest name on the show, mm -hmm. you know? Like, Hassan's uh, had, you know, been working for years and has uh, shows and films that everybody's seen. And the rest of us, it's, you know if not our first thing, one of our first things. So I knew it was going to be a thing that was slow. And I just hoped people would like give it a chance yes, and it. watch it yeah. because there are so many shows and, you know, you leave your house now and everyone just starts shouting show recommendations at you. <laughs> and you know what I mean? And they're <laughs> yeah. like, you haven't seen yeah. Sever? Are you even yeah. alive? Absolutely. You haven't seen industry yet? You know, you like, you constantly get guilted. So, you know, it's tough for it to even like for any show to like make an imprint. So anytime people were finding it and discovering it and it's sort of growing organically, like you said, it's like, like, you know, you found it just kind of randomly and, um, you know, we're drawn into it. I mean, that's cool. And so, yeah, it was definitely it was definitely a slow build. But we we're also lucky that people wrote it up a lot exactly. and it got it got all good reviews and stuff. And so that that helps also, you know? Because I think for me, like when I watch it all come together, right, and start seeing it, you know, gradually grow and, 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 you know, and build into its own thing, was like, okay, well, it makes sense now. If Hassan is the most recognizable face, we know his mm -hmm. capabilities mm -hmm. and it's got to be good. And I think right. that's what more people that did watch it gave it a chance, like Dan mm -hmm. said, got out of it, was like, well, if he was in it, it had to be good. Right. And look who's around him. This shit is funny. In right. a, even a, in a weird way, an off-kilter, you yep. know, kind of way, like this Flatbush setting mm -hmm. with these characters that right. are not from essentially the neighborhood or essentially natives of the neighborhood mm -hmm. that are making this like hit home like it is for them. And, and I think that's why I was glad to be a part. That's why I wanted to make that Zoom. I was like, they just need to know I get it. Yeah. And that, and I think that was also one of the most helpful things and a thing that is going to, that would take time for people to watch it and see what we're trying to they do. do. Yeah. Cause I think if people, you know, see it on paper, it's a tough show to describe, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so if you, just read it on paper. You're like, oh, two friends trying to make it. You know, we've seen some seen shit that, like that like before, before exactly. a million times. Right. But so then, but the goal of the show is always like, let's make a show that is not the Dan and Kevin show that is like a community and mm -hmm. flesh out those other characters, which takes time to care about 
the other characters. And there's a reason like comedies tend to get better second season because you figured out the characters more. You like know who's fun to play off and you're yeah. just more invested in them. Yeah. So yeah. Hassan's character, Kristen's character, Zayna, Kareem, like you get more invested in all of them. And so I think that also that also helps. And to see that it's not just you know, us two idiots at the center, but it's like a world, you know? And yeah. so that, that was, that's been fun to, and to I mean, build, and, you know? and for like a musical analogy, it's like when you hear about a rapper's volume two and you're like, well, I didn't hear volume one, <laughs> right, right, right. right? You got to go <laughs> sure. back and hear, oh, volume one is sick. And then you play yeah. volume one on repeat forever. Do you catch up the two? So right. I think that's what's happening with Flatbush and that, that's a, that's a better deal than coming in hot, like a one hit wonder thing. Then have these so big expectations for season two. Right. And then like just say the audience just don't get it or just take to it like they did one because one was so popular. It was such a the talk of the town and da 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 da. Right. So I don't think that pressure was on us naturally to have to do all of that. It was just like naturally you want to get better. You got to the playoffs first round, you right. want to get to the second round. <laughs> right. You get to the second round, you want to get to the semi, you know right. what I'm saying? And the, the chip. Yeah. So that's what we were. That's what we're just, doing. That's how we're doing it. For sure. And and then also the the fact that people like in Brooklyn and mm -hmm. in Flatbush and really all over Brooklyn have been so positive about the show yeah, is very, also yeah on location filming all of that is super love is forget about which it. is like really cool because you don't want to be you know there's a, you don't want to be like in the way you know what I mean you don't want right, it to be like way. when the president comes mm -hmm, to town exactly. and everyone's like oh fuck like nobody's <laughs> nobody's ever be been like whoa the president's here they're just <laughs> right. like what the fuck <laughs> yeah. like they're like mad you know Day, days over <laughs> it's days over before it started <laughs> so you just don't you don't want to be that you know as you want to have it be like and so mm -hmm. people you know uh uh in the neighborhood fucking with it and thinking it's cool which is a credit to Hassan and Kristen and so many people behind the camera who are born and raised in Brooklyn yes. and Carrie Cotta and so many other people involved in the show who can give it that um, that sort of added uh, knowledge yeah. and um, naturalism, you know? Well, season two uh, is now done. Uh, in season two, Dan ends up snitching on Hassan's character and essentially... <laughs> Hassan ends up in his in his AA meetings after he already admitted to the group that he had snitched on someone, and so this whole like kind of uncomfortable like terror that kind of goes through the whole second season of like, you know, when is Drew gonna find out about the snitching? And, yeah, and eventually, yeah. but there's some empathy you have for Dan. Even watching it, I'm not even as upset with Dan <laughs> as some of the shit that I've I've been upset right. for Dan doing less less than that. <laughs> You know what I'm because yeah, I'm yeah. just like, oh, Dan's back is always against the fucking wall. <laughs> How the hell did fucking Douglas get him to snitch like that? How, why? Oh, he had to do. No, I don't know who the guy was. There wasn't but, much he could do. He was too invested in his quarter waters and snacks. <laughs> Like all you had to do, you could have you could have threw him way off and said, "Well, how are those things?" Like, you could have made any other reference to get him off your case because I was ruined for Dan and that scene so bad. But uh, that's that's cool. That's cool that you felt that way because because <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at that scene, which is a, a tough scene to figure out how to right. do it, how to like Seriously. break down yeah. because it's a shitty thing my character does. But also a, a, a big thing we we're thinking about is like how do we flip a lot of the stuff yeah, in the second like, season? What's the, the first recourse season? and all this kind right because the first season. Kevin uh, is dealing with the stress of Drew, and then my character is like, "Well, why don't you call the cops? Why don't right, you call the cops?" Right. And Leave Kevin alone. Keep doesn't avoid do him. it. Avoid him. He doesn't do it, and then everything blows up. Yeah. And so this season, it's like, okay, if we went the other way, what would happen? Well, everything would blow, blow up. up. <laughs> and so it just happens in a different way. And there's something very fun about my character who's desperate to get back to normalcy and 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 teach again and right. be back. But then once you get back in that institutional environment of like okay you're back here okay now do this thing you're uncomfortable with yeah, and he's yeah, just tried he's just tried a season of completely lying and just fucking bullshitting and never worked yeah, everybody working, everyone yeah. hated him everyone was mad at him so he's like okay i'll try this other way and then of course what's gonna happen you yeah know? well and then in the second season uh you finally get to meet your brother well drew's brother uh who's played by sticky fingers right so uh, yeah, that guy, that guy black. My no, I mean, which is dope. Which now you get another sort of you know seasoned actor 
in the mix that you know, a lot course. of hip hop people and I, know. And, I, and it's always the element surpri of, of surprise that you can appreciate. And I think Sticky's the perfect wild card for that because now here he is the more sensible out of the two. Right. Or at least seemingly so. Right. Yeah. So you're like, wait a minute now. This dynamic here is crazy because <laughs> wait, like, he's he's not as wild as Drew or wilder than Drew. Sticky fan because of what we know of him and his capabilities. But so now but that adds some other validity and to the art of the show now. Because then now it's kind of you're reeling it back in. It's like the sensibility of it is getting reeled back in a little bit. And you're like, all right, they, we got to figure out now where is this going? Because this was like veering off the track, kind of grabbed the wheel back, caught it. Now let's see if, you know, we can stay on the course. And I think that's what's interesting because as soon as he comes in, it's like it's over. It was like this, this thing where like, oh, okay, you're getting comfortable now. Right. Oh, Zayna, dad's, dad's home. Okay. Right. Cross your legs now. And, see. and then it's like, <laughs> oh, okay, we got to wait now. We're in for some more. So I think that was a great nuance for the second season, for the finale especially. And that, and that scene, there's a scene in the last episode uh the season finale season two where you and uh uh Hassan and Sticky Fingers are kind of go at each other. Right. And that's such a good the two of them, it feels very real and it it's cool to see you don't you haven't really seen anybody talk to yeah, Drew that way. Like that. Yeah, right. and that's so, what that did for me so as well. It's just fun seeing this character we've seen for twenty episodes yep. and see him in a new context. Yep. And we haven't seen him like react that way. Yep. Where you know, you've seen Zayna get mad at Drew, and so you see that kind of disappointment. But to see, like, oh, this is his brother. This is somebody who has every reason to be frustrated yeah. that that Drew can't play the, like, I'm an adult. Yeah, I know what's best. Don't work with no. Him. Exactly. So it's just this different element. Yeah, and, and the two of them well. played it really, really well. Yeah. So is there a third season? We're not sure. So if people if people want it. You know, you know what I'm say saying? so. Say so, exactly. Just keep asking and, you know, request, be on a request line live. Uh, asking, <laughs> asking, ye maybe shall receive. <laughs> you know, you know, it's like that. <laughs> well, Hassan, I want to get uh, into your story as well. Mm -hmm. So you actually uh, grew up in uh, Park Hill, Staten Island? Yeah, Park Hill, Staten Island, yep. By way of Coney Island. So, like Dan was saying, it's like these, like how Flatbush and, you know, any way you go or just living in, mm -hmm. you know, Upper East Side and yep. then you have friends here and there. I think I had the best of both worlds as well because, you know, Coney Island is like another whole world. It's not even Brooklyn as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, no, no, no. And then Staten <laughs> Island is the forgotten fifth borough, right? I call that down south New York. <laughs> yeah. It is. And then so, I, I, but I've had the best of all. I wouldn't trade anything for, for, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Because, you know, I went to school in Staten Island. I spent my, my weekends in Coney Island. So there was that, you know, that Staten Island, Brooklyn boy. Like, you know, everybody knew that on Staten Island, I was from Brooklyn because I was always, my family was still there. But my immediate family was in Staten Island. So um, that that's the dynamic for me. So when Flatbush comes along, of course, I'm like, I'm all in. I'm getting to work in my backyard. I don't think anybody can do this better than I can. So like, hence Dan saying, ah, oh, fuck that shit. I'm too good. <laughs> Just put this Zoom call. Up. He was right. You know? He was totally right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I was like, I, I got this covered and smothered. But yeah, I'm a Staten Islander. That's right. Park Hill. Grew up with meth, Ray. <laughs> Uh, you God, right? Cause then Jizza and all of them dirty was from Brooklyn. They used to come over and hang out. But yeah, Park Hill, home of the Wu Tang. Right, and I mean, I've interviewed a bunch of the Wu Tang members before. I mean, what was it like? Cause you know, like you said, Staten Island is like the forgotten borough, mm -hmm. and there really hasn't been any big stars to have come out of Staten Island until Wu Tang, right. who became one of the biggest stars with you know the most famous logo in hip hop. Yeah, I mean, so what was on. it like being in that and just seeing like that blow up? I mean, it was great for me. I mean, because I mean, before that, I think it was like. Who was from Staten Island? I think Steven Seagal. <laughs> right? We were we were happy. Like, oh, Steven Seagal lives by the wall. Like, yeah. You know, like, that was the point kind of, of pride. Yeah, that, that, that was the highlight for us in school. But, but no, but, you, but you're right, though, Vlad. Like, it was, it was something special because um, I used to hang out outside. And my cousin, you know, God rest his soul, his name was Ryan. They called him each. He was best friends with Divine and RZA. And I think mm. when Meth came from Long Island... He introduced 
Method Man to RZA. And then they started off, you know, figuring out what, what it is they wanted to do with themselves and rapping became the the uh the, the outcome. But I knew there was something special about Method Man for sure. And mm. uh it was just something about him because he was a tree, he was tall as a tree, lanky, jovial, big right. kid. Meth's this big kid. You know what I mean? But he had something. And then him and Ugar used to always rap at the Chinese restaurant around the corner from our building on Tarji Street. And it would be Ugar beatboxing, or you know, you know, on the on the counter of the restaurant, and then Meth would be rapping. And then it's just the stuff he was saying and how he was saying it with this ashy ass voice was just incredible. And then I was just like, with I, and I know in my mind I was saying if the rest of the world gets to hear this, they they won't forget about us no more because we were outside just like ain't nobody worried about what's going right. on out here, <laughs> you know. But you're hearing about all the stuff in Harlem and Queens and Brooklyn. You hearing about all the, the the players and the drug deal, you know all that. And we had our fair share. We did, but it was still just because we were over that water, over that bridge. And it's a suburb, primarily it's a suburb, right? Seven out of 10 people there are Trump supporters. You know what I mean? Just to get the, just to get the gist of what's going on. So yeah, that's what, that's what we were dealing with. A lot of racism, but not, you know, nothing to even like, not Mississippi burning racism, but enough that it was, it was a taste on your tongue. I mean, mm -hmm. shit, one of my childhood friends, got ran over by a car coming from Rosebank. It was a neighborhood called Rosebank down the street from Park Hill. Now you could walk. We used to cut through these woods to walk there. There was a school, PS 13, we played at. Now, some of the kids went to school there from the neighborhood. I didn't. I went to PS 11 in Stapleton. But there were always those racial, you know, tensions and stuff like that because the schools are in the suburbs. It's like we have our neighborhoods, our inner city, our neighborhoods, our projects, but we go to school in the suburbs. So we had to deal with that and it became second nature. And I I love where I'm from. I I it didn't I didn't get bit, it didn't turn me bitter. I just I saw it what it for what it was. It was like some people are gonna like you, some people ain't. Right. And that's just the way it is. <laughs> right. For whatever reason, whether you tall, short, black, white, or other. So I think that's why I say it was the best of both worlds growing up for me. Cause then I got to, you know really ride that wave and that fine line. Like I could have one foot in, one foot out in a good way. You know what I'm saying? And um, I think that's what made me a survivor for in Park Hill and in the rest of the city as well. Cause I could just blend in and adapt. You could go to the Coney, uh, the Coney Island Cyclone yep. or be close to Steven Seagal. Go, right, either way. <laughs> both was, worlds, you know yeah. what I'm saying? That either end of the spectrum, it was happening. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, now thank God for that. Well, you're going to high school, and I guess someone dared you to audition for Clockers? Yes, that is the story. So I was a football player, and then I was in this this program at Port Richmond High School called PRISM. Okay. Everybody thought it, it was prison, because if you say it, but it was <laughs> PRISM, P-R-I-S-M. So it was Port Richmond, Port Richmond Institute of Science and Math. So my mother did everything in her soul and fiber to make sure I had the best education I could because she knew that was nothing else for me to make it in life except have a better education. Young, black, you know, struggling. You got the odds against you. You know the story. All right, so you got to go out double, triple times as much as everybody else to get what you need just to be on the even keel. Sure. And I was like, she always put that in me and understood that. So I went to school. I never cut class a day in my life. Never ditched or cut class a day in my life from kindergarten to 12th grade because I was scared Francis would find out and I'd be dead. <laughs> so she put that fear in my heart right. that kept me on easy street. Right. So, you know, I saw it. I excelled in school. That wasn't nothing. I played ball. I thought I was going to be a baller. But the dead fucked my ball career up because what happened was I got dead to go, right? So Ariana, there was this girl. She was so smart. And my boy Tristan was dating her. And she was like, all right, well, mister, I want to be on TV because I guess that's all I ever <laughs> expressed that I wanted to do with myself yeah. in life yeah. besides the academics and the, the sports. <laughs> She said, I dare you to go to this clock is or this is Spike right. Lee's having an open call. And, you know, back then it was just a straight Xerox copy, black and white, no right. full color, nothing fancy. And so I was at lunch at the time. And I remember looking around, everybody at the lunch table and asked, well, she want me to go to this audition. Who coming with me? 
And then everybody did one of these things and kind of looked away and scratched their head. So I said, all right, I folded the piece of paper up, I put it in my back pocket, I went home. It was a weekend, the audition, and it was raining. <laughs> so I was bored. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I said, wait a minute, that thing's the day. <laughs> <laughs> Jumped up, checked my pants pocket. Oh, I got time. Yeah. Got on the Staten Island Ferry, just like I did to come here. Yeah, damn. Got yeah. on the ferry, took the train up, and it was in Harlem, I believe, the school. I can't remember what school it was, and I went. Long story short, I got picked out of the audience. I went back to the audition. Aisha Coley was the casting director. She took my Polaroid, gave me this information sheet, where to go. And I went, and the rest is history. Now, eight callbacks later, Spike had his work tooth and nail. I mean, eight callbacks? Eight callbacks. Damn. And I didn't get the lead role because it was for Strike that, that was played by Makai Pfeiffer. But they still made an offer. And I remember on the phone, because what happened was I came home and my dad was like, if you don't call them 40 acres and the mule people back, man, they been calling here all day. I was like, 40 acres and a mule? All oh, that Spike leak. So she's like, we fought hard. We wanted you for the lead role, eyes, but it didn't work out. But Spike still wants you to be in the film. And I'm like, hell yeah. This is the first movie I ever auditioned first for? First movie I ever auditioned for, crazy. man, at, a, at an open call. I yeah. got in there, principal character, principal role. We worked, we started the day after the 4th of July, the summer of 1994. And we wrapped like two days before school started. Right. So I didn't go to football camp that summer. Damn. My coach yeah. didn't start me for the first three games. Right. So whoever he did start in my position got hurt. I went in and ended up doing my thing. But all the little prospects, the uh, the the bat, the football letters and stuff like that, my coach didn't help me fill out, get back to them and stuff like that. You know, you the coach and, and the student, Man, you got to walk him through the whole thing. I bet he's reached out since. Yeah, I've been I bet like, he did. I always knew. I always knew you were a talent. And yeah. Coach Perich, man, oh. you came from Madison, too. You, you coached at Madison High School in Brooklyn, and you came to Staten Island, and you messed up my dreams, man, but I still Fuck made yeah. it. That's, that's, your, that's a Michael Jordan Hall of Fame speech. Yes. Where you fly, fly to, fly to <laughs> yep. high school coach yep. there and yep. be like, you fucked up. You fucked up. Not <laughs> me you did <laughs> look at you now yeah, look at me. <laughs> nobody nobody started over you as playing in the nfl after, after that, right? and you are still acting yeah, and, still. And, and that's what's so funny because you know I, I finished my high school career out right and i started acting so then when i graduated and i see friends from school and, and i tell because we know you come back from school that mm -hmm. senior year for that september yeah. like what did you do and then yeah, yeah. most kids they went to florida they went to, <laughs> You know, stuff like that. Disney. Yeah, they bro. worked at Blockbuster. Like yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, you go visit your family members. Right. I did a movie, but nobody's like <laughs> believing or jacking that shit. Right. It's like, what were you, uh, an extra high? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> but then when Clockers comes out and everything, and then I do New York Undercover was like the first thing after Clockers that I did. Then it was Law and Order, and it was all the guest star roles on all the t television shows that they did in New York City, NYPD mm -hmm. Blue, you name it. It was like, oh, you wasn't bullshitting. You were serious. I'm hitting with the emoji. <laughs> I mean, I tried to tell you, you know. I asked, matter of fact, a couple of you guys to come with me. You didn't want to go. Right, right. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying. You know, that. The I'm doing have... interviews with Dan and Vlad. I'm just saying. That's how the shit go. First audition. <laughs> first audition, man. The first audition I ever went on, the casting person was like, are you an actor? And I was like, no, I do comedy. And he, and he was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, if you would have just said, no, yeah, I'm in that. He yeah, knew. Right he was like, why am I looking at <laughs> you? Because it's not because of what you just it's did. Right. You got to be good at something okay. else. Yeah, right. And I just want to know what. what? It is. But it ain't acting. <laughs> it's not this. Right, thank you. Okay, got it. <laughs> well, uh, you do Clockers and you had the roles like New York Undercover and yep. you know the, the other TV shows you mentioned. And then in 97, you were in The Devil's Own. Yeah, with 96, Her 97. Ford, with Brad yeah, Pitt. With, yeah, with Brad Pitt and Harrison Ford. Damn. That, that yeah. was the second. That was my second film. <laughs> the second mm -hmm. film. Alan Pakula, rest in peace. He was the greatest, man, because, you know, it was back then. It was the City Kids was like the drama program of New York. Like, if you went to City Kids, I know that's where Malik Yoba was from. Several other actors. And they were, and they, it was a bunch of them coming up there for the role. And so I went 
And Gordon and Gordon Willis. Is that the, the casting director? I can't remember. Gordon Willis, the cinematographer. No, Gordon Willis, cinematographer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gordon shot uh, 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 Devil's Own. I okay. think that's what it is. Okay. Yeah, Gordon Willis shot Devil's Own. But I can't yeah. remember the casting director, but she was, oh, she was the greatest because she was like, I guess I did my thing, mm -hmm. and she goes, "Can you come back in like in like two hours and do that same thing for the director again?" I said, "Yeah, well, I, I'll, I'll definitely be back in two hours. I got nothing to do with myself." <laughs> so at the time, this is ninety six, ninety seven, but so Corey Rooney was the vice president at Sony, and at that time, a friend of mine from Staten Island was trying to get a record deal. So it was Bimmy, Bimmy from the Supreme Team, was 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 uh like liaisoning. And 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 like all this developing us and that, hanging out in the studio. So Corey Rooney was one of the big homies. So I was like, let me just go over there and kill some time, get my shit together, and I'm gonna go back around the corner and, and do my callback. Mm -hmm. That was same day callback. Like they don't do that no more. Like those, those days are over. So go kick it. That was the first time I think I met Mariah Carey up at the Sky Lobby at Sony with Tommy Matola. Like that was some crazy shit. Yeah. Um, yeah, it wasn't social media back then. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> the people so you that, met pre-Instagram. Yeah. You're like, man. <laughs> Damn, if only, if only. Nah, but that was, a, that was a kick right there. And then I went back, I did my thing, and then I booked it. But then she, they made a, 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 you know, their business to say, like, you know, we we saw a lot of talent. And for you to be as raw as you are, don't come a dime a dozen. So we just wanted to let you know how much of a lifesaver you are. Because I think that meant they could pay me less, really. Right. What's with it? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what that meant. I think y'all don't have to pay the quota. Now. You have this you raw know? talent <laughs> that we can underpay. Yeah, so <laughs> good little bit of that. You know, you're saving us a little grip. Do your thing with Harry. Yeah. Yeah. And then Harrison was great on set. Ruben Blades. I mean, come on. Second film, I was, I was with some hitters. Yeah. I was with some hitters. Okay, but then in 1998 came the film that most of us know you for, which is Belly. Belly, that's right. Now, 98 was my year. <laughs> <laughs> just like the, just like the, what's the, what's the pimp that said, 90, 77 was my year. 98 was my year because I did Belly. I did in too deep as well, and I did black and white. But back to belly, that was another one of those early in my career, Dan, where yeah. I felt like I'm too good for this shit. Because <laughs> <laughs> Hype Williams had an open call for that. Yeah. He went the same route Spike did. Like That was right. the thing, right? And he's like, I'm looking for this character to play Tommy Buns and this, that, the third. But then what happened, because I said, I'm not going to that. I'm definitely not doing that all over again. Right. So... Another homie of mine, big homie from Staten Island, that's also an actor as well, graffiti legend Gano, Gano Grills, gave me the cheat sheet and where the audition was. So I more or less crashed that audition. But what happened was Money, Power, Respect came out. So I'm thinking I'm going in for the lead role. I'm going for the gusto at all times. I'm not thinking about these other, you know, uh, principal roles and mm -hmm. co-star roles. So I'm going in there with, you know, my A game. But then at the same time, I'm listening to the radio hypes talking about he found his Tommy because uh, he saw the video and he's like, yo, this guy DMX is it. Now, unbeknownst to everyone else, he was because that was the best. I can't imagine anybody else leading that film. Like, I just can't. It, the X was the pick of all picks. But, yeah, I got, I crashed that audition. I got an audition. I did my thing. Method Man comes into the, the to the, the office, I think, one day. Sees my name on, like, the wall or my, my headshot on the wall, like, you know, on the wish list or whatever it is they have in the office. And he's like, oh, that's my cousin. And he's telling Hype, yeah, I'm not going to, I can't do it unless, you, is he, did you cast him? Because I'm not going to do it unless he's in it. Right. And then I'm just like, oh, I got the boost from Method Man. <laughs> so now, you know, That's so when close. I come yeah. back, Hype tells me the story. He's like, no, you were in it, but Meth just made sure. Like, right. he, he locked I, it in. Yeah, yeah, so just might want to give him a call just right. for, the, yeah. you know, <laughs> all intents and purposes. But, yeah. yeah, that's how Belly happened. And um, and I'm probably, like, the only non-rapper in that movie. Right. Like, everyone else that had principal roles were rappers. Or, or singers, right? I mean, maybe, well, yeah, even, even, uh, who played Keisha? What was her name? The dark skin one. She was from a Bronx uh. tale.
Terrell Hicks. Terrell Hicks. Because she Terrell even Hicks. put in, she even recorded an album. So, yeah, I was like the only, like, you know, straight actor in that film. So, Sons, you, so you did that um, in Valley, but then also in Flatbush, you were with a bunch of comedians. And in both of them, he blends in right. as well. <laughs> That's as what I'm trying anybody. to get at. He fits exactly. in wherever you throw him. It's just, and just being. Staying within himself also. Yeah. Just crushes it. That's what that's what I think I learned that about myself and Belly though, because then I had to look back and I was like, well, wow, this was all musical talent and a film directed by a video director. Right. It was just a, a hour and a half video. Right. It was just an hour and a half long video. You know, that's and I mean into Hype's legacy, he's like the only person that ever pulled that off. And I mean, it's a it's a classic. It's a, it's definitely a classic. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's an all-time classic. One of my favorite films. I mean, in fact... You know I, how many story, pages are ripped out uh, of there, though, Vlad? It would have been a whole nother movie, though. It was yeah. so many pages that got ripped. There was at least five scenes uh, that got omitted or deleted from the film. Yeah. And it still turned out to be, you know what I'm saying, what it was. Yeah. That's what I think is great about it. People don't know that behind the scenes. That's not the script, the way it goes from beginning to end. Right. So if you notice, there's a little hole in there that they fill up with with uh, Frank Vincent when they implement the feds. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more in between it that was going on before that happened. They show how the feds got on to us, but they had to skip over that line because of the budget. We would just like uh, over budget the first two weeks. Yeah. yeah, we didn't even shoot it. Like I was on set some days right. in full wardrobe and just got ready. They're just ripping it. Yeah, out. yeah. Like, go home. Yeah, go home. So I well, yeah, I mean, video. Uh, that <laughs> film was uh, was such an influence on me because I remember when I interviewed Mr. Vegas, I, I told him that that, you know, dance hall scene in Jamaica made me want to become a DJ. I've probably done a thousand interviews in my day, but I I'm going to explain to you why, why this one right here is, is special to me. Because right around 2000, I right. was going through a, a very transitional period in my life. Right, I was going right. through a bad breakup and my business was shutting down. Right. And um, I watched Belly. Wow. And there was the scene in Jamaica in the club. Right. And Sucky Ducky came <laughs> on. Yes. And, and the way with the music and how Hype Williams yep. did the visuals, yep. Yep. I, was, I, was, I was mesmerized. Right. Right. And, and at that point, I decided that I'm going to leave my old life behind and I'm going to go into DJing. Wow. Because wow. Cause the vibe, like I'd never seen that vibe before. I'd never been to Jamaica at that point, anything right. else like right. that. Right. And, uh, you know, I always wanted to do music. I did it on the side. But then when I saw that, I said, this is, this is what I want to do. In fact, wow. maybe you want to become a, a reggae DJ. I ended up in, uh, DJing for Barrington Levy. Right, right. <laughs> I got yep, so yep. so like obsessed with that scene. I'm like, yo, I've never seen that type of energy before. No, I that was great though, Vlad. It was when that coming Vegas, Sean Paul's in it too, right? Vegas, right, Sean exactly. Paul. Like, if, yeah, that was such a classic. And then it was like, like you said, that energy. If you have never been to Jamaica, that was the closest to being in Jamaica that you could be without being in Jamaica. <laughs> Seriously, he definitely he did right, that that's one hype. Well, that's Absolutely. where a lot of the budget went to, too. They had to go right. to Jamaica. Right, right, right. They had yeah. to go to Jamaica. Well, uh, you played part of uh, DMX's crew. Well, DMX and Nas's robbery yep. crew. Yep, yep. I was right? Mark, yep. Well, were you the one that had stripped down? No, now nah, that was no. Jay Black, right? That played, I forgot his character. But the, that was Jay Black, nonetheless. But I, okay. I, play, I was Mark. So that was my, my grandmother's basement in that scene that that happened. So it ah, was, okay. and, then, and then it was Stan Spit that played L.A. Kid, and then my dude Jason Parrish that played the other the other kid that you know ex instigated the shooting at the restaurant at towards the end of the movie. But yeah, no, I played Mark, so I robbed the tunnel with them in the beginning. Right, it was the three right. of us. Right, there we go, uh, there we go. Uh, and then you were in in Too Deep right around the same time. Yep, and Too Deep came out that year. We shot that in Cincinnati, Toronto, and LA. So yeah, that that budget, did, those pages didn't get ripped out. <laughs> we, we barely, <laughs> we, ba we barely left the studio. Yeah, we barely. That's what I'm saying. That, that we budget, were lucky. We were lucky to go from the stage to to yeah, flat you know push them back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're not going. We're not crossing state lines. You know what I'm saying? 
So, yep, it was it was uh in too deep after that. And that's probably that's probably my favorite though. I mm. we I had the most fun on that film than anything. I mean, LL did his thing, Omar, Nia Long. I mean, you know, Gannel's in that one too. Sticky Fingers is in that one too. Nas is in that. Nas has that little cameo in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, well, I heard you actually try to holler at Nia Long on set. Yeah, I did because we were all hanging out in Omar's room one night. And I think it was the weekend, so we were getting fired up. And I was just pushing up. I'm like, ain't nobody in here pushing up on Nia. <laughs> but I, and I actually got that on camera. My boy, um, really? my boy, uh, who's my boy, Daryl, right? Daryl Stuntman. He had his camcorder. Oh, so he's so got cool. like the eight millimeter of that or something somewhere. <laughs> and he's just like, yo, Haas, I still got that when you need it for oh, the man. documentary. Yeah. I was like, yes. They just lock it in the vault. Just keep it safe. And we're good. Oh, man, that's to go to the Library yeah. of Congress. But, <laughs> but Nia wasn't. Nia, I mean, she just thought it was cute. She just kept smiling and laughing. Who's <laughs> this little nigga right now? He like, you got confidence, though. You know, I don't know. And if I you got the that. and if I got the you number, need... I took too long to call her, so it was probably right. changed. Mm. <laughs> no, you need that. You need to you need to be yeah. ready to take any shot. You, you know? know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I did it. I did it. <laughs> Shout out to Nia. Shout out to Nia. Well then in two thousand two you were in paid in full. Yes, oh two was paid in full, that's right. Cause I went I went out for that lead role as well, Mitch. But then they got Makai, and then of course Makai was the great pick. Who else better than to play Rich Porter, aka Money Making Mitch, and paid in full than Makai? Right? He's from Harlem. I mean, he embodied the character. He did his thing. But I did my thing so well, you know. Chuck Stone, shout out to Chuck. You know, Chuck was the director that did the Budweiser uh, campaign. The what's up? Remember that? Yeah. That was yeah. classic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Boy, Chuck, that was, that yeah, was that a thing. Was, that was, yeah, what's up? <laughs> yeah, Chuck did that. So Chuck- uh, he, He's responsible for a lot <laughs> of annoying like, people yeah, that year. like that. <laughs> Sorry, Chuck, but you know, I had to let him know. I had to give him your flowers. It was successful, yeah. So yeah, Chuck did that and um, he reached back out. There was some like reshoots that they needed to do. And they reached back out. And that was the scene where me and Mitch, Money Making Mitch, and I forgot my guy Tobias, Trevelyan is in that as well. We shot up Jamie Hector, a.k.a. Marlo from The Wire, on the stoop in that scene in Paid in Full. That was Marlo. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's crazy how everything comes full circle. Right. Because then in 2002, you started as a regular character on The Wire. Exactly. Playing Wee Bang. Yep. And... From that show came the famous meme. That's right. Which a lot of people don't know that, but that's where it's from. <laughs> okay. Heard, that's from can, we see, can, can we see what the meme looks like in real life? <laughs> oh, with the real see life. The meme? It, right. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was, he was, what, 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 what did my dude say? He was, uh, he was like, you was really flabbergasted and dumbfounded <laughs> in that scene, bro. That, some people get a kick out of that. Like I was really doing some exceptional acting. <laughs> and it was just, I was just like, nah, he just said, you know, we thought it was the girl or the guy or something. And <laughs> that was it. I didn't realize, but you know what? That was, I don't, I don't know if who shot that episode, Uda or can't remember who shot the episode, but I think it was that that in that imposing pushing yeah. when they do it, and then it's like You're a sh- right yeah. focus or something that You're makes shocked. it so yeah. dramatic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes it like the most shocked person on in life. It's yeah, it's like it's serious, but there's so much like you just bring this comedy right, to right. everything. Also, yeah, yeah. you're just I like you it can't. Was fucking funny. <laughs> I was like, but <laughs> you like can't believe it, yeah, and I'm so like, yeah. we shot. Oh, we shot the wrong person. Right. <laughs> that's really what we made. It's like, was, oh fuck, yeah. he was laughing inside. That's well, that's really, and you because you do that also in that in the scene the sentencing scene yeah where, you, where you're owning up to everything yep. where Weebe is like is just trying to eat a little yeah, more he you just know? wants to eat and I was hungry that day because that was like a 6 a.m. <laughs> call time so I'm really eating those those were real pit beef sandwiches from Baltimore it was like the funniest scene yeah that, that, that was medium <laughs> or a lot of horseradish <laughs> yeah. like, I don't even know what's going on no more just and you do that you one. do that shrug you just <laughs> yeah, like yeah, yeah just another one yeah. yeah yeah nah man classic material to wire mm-hmm I mean, really one of the best TV shows ever. Period. Yeah. 
I'm, I've, 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 I'm putting it up there in the top three, if not top five, if not top three. My favorite is Breaking Bad, you know. Oh, yeah. Because I never saw any of what happened coming. Right. That Walter White, um, Brian Cranston. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's mm -hmm. a fucking animal. Whoa. But, I mean, but what the, I mean, you look at all the people who came out of The Wire and the different sort of uh, uh, worlds. No, you're right. That, it like organically incorporates yes that's yeah. what like i don't know many shows that have been able to do that you i mean know? yeah from wendell pierce to dominic west right. the deidre lovejoy john doman clark peters uh michael williams uh uh uh, uh lance reddick right larry gilliard jd williams andre Roy. i mean crazy. they go crazy i mean and crazy. everyone's a hitter everyone's solid yeah like super solid and to change the like environments Within a show, you know, most shows, it's like it's set in a bar and you're just going to live in that bar for yeah, a decade. Yeah, exactly. Or it's staying mm -hmm. in the diner. But yeah. like, you are able to constantly like move the characters around. Exactly. And That's what still I keep the like core of the show and what makes it great. Yeah. 30 principal yeah. actors at any given time and you're keeping up with Crazy. every last one of them. Yeah. And care. And yeah. Care and you care. I don't know if anyone's attention span has been that undivided since that show. That's what's tough about now is I don't yeah, know if yeah. people, they would even give people a chance to commit yeah, like that. That's, that's the thing. When it's there, if people want it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Idris Elba, you forgot to mention him. Yeah, he right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Stringer, Idris right. Elba, like, come yeah. on. It's like, really the top <laughs> yeah. of the crop, the cream of the crop. Right, and I mean, Wood, it wasn't Harris, until later. Yeah, yeah right, yeah. Avon yeah. Barksdale, come on. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it wasn't until later I realized that he was British because that accent was just on point on that show. Yeah, no, he did his thing. It just, I think back then for me when I found out was like right before, because we were shooting the pilot, but we shot that pilot like that November 01 before, after 9-11. Let's just put it like that. It was after 9-11. But I think Grant and Foreman had a heavyweight uh, bout that mm -hmm. week or week in that month, something like that, that year. And Idris and I walked from the hotel down to the Hyatt and the, in the harbor. And I guess he had like a home check mm -hmm. that he was on the phone doing and he got a little upset and the accent came out and I stopped, looked at him and he just kept walking for about another 20 yards. I'm like, this nigga not even from out here. <laughs> Like, oh, you was fooling us for just fooling us. Like, as you were in the lobby yeah. talking with the American accent, so you're practicing. I get it. The dedication and commitment is, be, is bar yeah. none. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. it came out in a little argument. I guess he couldn't. And I was like, all right. Then he started giving me his history and origins and Wolverine story and shit. Like That's that. what sometimes <laughs> I'll see comments of people, right? <laughs> about us on the show and they'd be like, man, they sound just like the character. Like, uh, like right. you, think, you think we're going to be British? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Like everybody's <laughs> British. <laughs> Kareem, nah, nah. Kareem straight out yeah, of yeah, straight out <laughs> Shakespearean. Yeah, right, straight out of Royal Brixton. Academy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> East London. Stratford upon Stratford, Avon. Yeah. yeah, nah, mate, nah. <laughs> well, I mean, you mentioned Michael K. Williams who came off that show also, who played Omar Little. Yeah. Uh, essentially a gay gangster. Yeah. You know, who's the, the most feared character on that show. Yeah, probably of all time. And mm -hmm. I mean, and, and legit, and legit too. Like Mike was legit with that. And I told him, I remember that third episode, I think he comes in on the first season and I read it. And I said to myself, I said, whoever they cast for this got a hell of a job to do, but if they do it right. And it's, it's curtains from, from it's, you know, so, and oh, Mike yeah. came on set and I told him, I said, oh, you got to do is deliver. Mike, you know you got it in you. Mm -hmm. Mike looked at me with that little, <laughs> and, and then it's off to the races, man. He did his thing. I mean, he passed away a little bit less than a year ago yeah. uh, on September 6th. Were you guys close? And, and how did you feel when you heard about him? No, no, very close. Um, Very close. I cried when Mike died. I definitely shed a few tears, man, because Mike was like one of the most genuine you know, loving, caring, and it's not like on that cliche shit neither. Mike loved you more than himself. And that's the that was the problem. Mike bared so much on his shoulders and wanted to save everybody, and he just couldn't. It deteriorated himself. He broke himself down trying to save everyone else, being that vessel. And that's brave. That's really what it is. He was he was really just brave at the end of the day, probably braver than anybody I know that he was so selfless in his mission and yo, and, and he was, yo, he was dedicated 
beyond belief, like that commitment. Like I'm like, Mike got some type of sleep deprivation thing going on. Like I got to get my little six hours. I don't know how Mike doing all this shit. Like he's there front line for the community and, and he really means it. And then that's, that's what's the sad part about him not being here. Cause then, it, cause then yet again, it's the, the person that's carrying that torch we need is gone. And then we got to wait and see who picks it up or if it even gets passed down. And um, yeah, we're going to miss him. Yeah. Like he was always a scene stealer, whether it was The Wire yeah. or Boardwalk, Amp Boardwalk Empire, yeah, Boardwalk, which he just yeah. killed right, in there. Uh, you know, Lovecraft County. Lovecraft, like, yep. I mean, he was in Lackawanna Blues and all. I could throw, you know, I could throw it back to eight, the the original HBO films, whatever it is. I mean, Mike's gonna make it good. He's gonna make your your project good or better. Guarantee. How did it feel to play Bobby Brown in the, the Bobby Christina movie? <laughs> Oh, that was a that was a that was a blast too. <laughs> Only because it, at first I said hell no. Right. I'm not doing that after the new edition story. Did you see yeah. what, what Woody McClain just did with that Bobby Brown? Right. Oh y'all want me to? I said oh this is a setup. Y'all want to sabotage my shit, right? Y'all want me to play Bobby after this kid, this young fucking kid just murdered this shit. Right. Y'all want me to come and just embarrass myself. But it was like, no, nah, it was just this humanized version of Bobby to tell his daughter's story, which I think some people needed to see or hear. And um, I'm glad I was uh, a part of that. Um, and uh, Trey... Uh, Tracy Baker, right? I think is the producer for that. And uh, good looking out, Tracy, because I didn't see it until I was in makeup. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, oh, damn, I do look like Bobby. So I'm not singing. I'm not singing. I'm not dancing. I'm not dancing. <laughs> well, let's go. <laughs> we're we're going we're gonna to have a son sing in the musical episode. Oh, oh, oh shit. I got to get my vocals <laughs> up. Drew's Lament. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, they love that. Whoa. <laughs> well, I mean, th th there's so many movies you've done. Like, because I'm just skipping around. I mean, Brooklyn's Finest. Yeah, uh, that was another on, one. Mike, uh, me and Post Mike was in that TV one. TV series, yep. Blacklist TV series. So, I mean, really, the, I mean, you've essentially been working nonstop since '97. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I missed a summer well, or a winter. <laughs> I don't think right. so. Well, well, really, really, since '95, actually, because Clockers well, came, Clockers out, in came 95, out '95. So. That's right, it did October. Right. So, I mean, for everyone out there who's wants to be an actor what's really the formula to consistently stay a working actor for all these decades at this point a formula i mean because unless you're just a genius mastermind that like an alchemist you could just turn water to wine this to gold <laughs> you gotta believe in yourself for me it was believing in myself but see when i got my my first agent cynthia Cass at the artist group i love her to death cynthia i hope you're doing all right haven't spoken to you in a very long time. But she told me, this is the one of the only things my mom had ever walked me into in my career was to sign with my first agent. Because essentially I was underage because I was lying to Spike to get in the film because Spike wanted a 18 to 25 year old profile. Right. And I've always kind of was older and I had this old soul anyway. So right. I got by the skin of my teeth on that. So when I signed with the artist group, Cynthia's like, see, Problem with you is, <laughs> she said, because you're going to learn the hard way, man. You came in on such a top tier level, principal casted role in a, you know, a studio film. Um, and you're going to just find out that it's not that easy. She was like, you're going to, you're just going to find out it's not that easy. Like roles ain't going to just be getting thrown your way because you was right. in a Spike Lee movie. Right. She told me and my mother straight to my face. Like, I'm telling you now. <laughs> that's I mean that's good because usually <laughs> like the usual thing you'd hear is they're like lying to you to try to work with you right. they're gonna be like you're gonna be on billboards yeah. you're gonna be at the top you're gonna be they front row at the Oscar this time ass. tomorrow yeah. and then they this blow you off and they blow yeah. you off <laughs> right. first two three auditions you don't book shit it's right. over they're, they're right? gone yeah, 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 yeah. Right. right so she's telling me like no you make your mind up if this is what you want to do because you know when when I don't know how they do it now but when you when I signed back then for, with uh, with artist group they give you a monologue and you do the monologue on the spot. I did my thing. So then I, she puts that away. She's like, okay, well now this is what you're in for. You got talent, but you about to get your whole wig pushed back. Rejection, 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 rejection. So I tell people I'm in the art of rejection. I mean, I'm in the business of being told no. 
Like, mm-hmm. that's I get told no for a living. Right. Like, I get told no for a living. I took care of my family being told you're not the best. Like, I don't have no ego. People tell me, like, you know, you can't tell me about not having my way, me not having my way. I am the way. I tell people, like, I know all too well about not having my way. Right. I'm, I, I get rejected for a living. I don't know how many people could deal with that. You know what I mean? And then, yeah. and, and then to me, it just makes me go a little harder in my mind and in my belief system of myself that you got nobody to rely on. Nobody cares about your story, your struggle, none of that. Just make it happen, Haas. Just make it happen. Don't let them see you sweat. And, and that's it. And you see that with, a, like, I see that in you, like, on set, like, the work you put in. Right. To the characters, and then also just how you are, like professionally, right, just how right. you treat everybody. You can tell the people who have that energy on set, mm-hmm. and that's from now two seasons. You see the people who come in and have that mindset, yes. who treat everybody from PAs to yes. producers yes. to directors yes. to people Equally they're in scenes with everybody because they have that mindset of yeah. like I'm. Get, I could be told no. I this this could be gone in a minute. It it's going to be, be on to the next minute. thing. Yeah, and you just have that. And I think if you have that mindset, then that's that's what has people like Hassan, you know? They'll yeah. just always work. Well, uh, Dan Perlman and Hassan Johnson, appreciate you guys coming in. Uh, I was sincerely a fan of the show. I mean, Dan, you and I kind of met on Twitter in a yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, that was, I, I was I was saying how, I think I just, it was a random tweet. I was like, yo, I love this show. And someone was like, yo, you need to interview Dan. And then you suddenly jumped in the conversation. Yeah, someone tagged me. Oh, man, I see, that's that <laughs> Stockton mentality. He's coming, he's thinking someone, about plays. Someone t- <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dan's sitting plays, man. Tell well, me. I know. I, I passed it here. I know yeah. Hassan will be there. Yeah, you he see, got it. No, no look. Dishes. You see, you see, ah. you see, D.Y. just lob it up, and you're like, "Where's he lob it yeah. to?" And then LeBron's gonna come, come in. You're like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> That's what he wants. <laughs> he knows. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, listen, dude. Whoever hasn't watched it, it's a very, very dope show. It's very different. I remember uh, you did an interview, I think, with Smoke Dizza, where they compared it to like it's like a Curb Your Enthusiasm in the Hood. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Smoke I think, that, I think that's a good Smoke that's Dizza. a good uh, analogy for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that no. was. And that, yeah, but that's all. The the cast, you know, it's like Hassan, Kristen Dodson, but then also like comedians like Roy Wood Jr. and Yamanika Saunders and Maria oh. Bamford and just like killers yeah. who just come in and, and crush it. So yeah. it's like that's what lends it that kind of curb naturalism is all of them. Yeah, it is. And they 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 make our lives easier. And, I, and I'm just glad that I can like stay afloat. You know, Hassan's funnier than most of us. Hassan's, <laughs> Hassan's <laughs> is funny. Hassan <laughs> makes lines work that are not jokes in that first season. I always think about it. It's in the fifth episode and Zayna can't dance. Uh, she, she's suspended. Right. And can't dance from the dance team. And then you say, you say to her, you're like, but you're the best dancer. Right. That's not a joke. <laughs> and right. the way he says it, I laughed every time. Right. Yeah, yeah. He's dancing. In this but season. You're the best in, dancer. In, in like, this, what's wrong with them? In this season, he's at the art fellowship and he's talking to Nancy. He's like, my niece goes to Delaney. They can't even afford set dressing for their school play. <laughs> Again, not a joke. And the way he says it, I'm like, how the fuck does he make that a joke? Why is that funny right now? That's so like, great. that's tragedy right now. Like, when you're laughing at it. It's just, the like, school can't it's just exposition. And he's making it a joke. <laughs> It's crazy. <laughs> Not nah, good shit. Oh, man. Good uh, shit. Great show. And I really sincerely hope that he gets renewed for a third season. Yeah, we, really we do too. Thank you, it's gonna but go we, these characters. we got, you know, good hopes. Appreciate you, man. No doubt, man. Until next time. We shall all, all right, the best. See you later, Vlad. Peace. Yeah, man. Word up.